This is the Sunday that I've been so excited about and starting uh, as we journey through the book of Romans together. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever really studied the book of Romans. Uh, how many of you have, no, I'm not asking for a raise of hand, but I wonder how many of you have really gone verse by verse. Now, if you're involved in our church-wide study, uh, our Foundations New Testament study that we're doing collectively as a church family, either as individuals or families or in our small groups, then we've studied through and read through, I should say, the book of Romans already. And you've journeyed through that. So maybe that was your first introduction uh, to this amazing letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. So today we're going to begin this study through the book of Romans. was praying I'm saying Lord I'm going to be unpacking probably one of the most important books in the entire Bible that's filled with doctrine I just pray you lead me and guide me and help me deliver it in a manner that will be pleasing and honoring to the Lord so that folks can receive it prayed for you. I pray that you're able to receive it. Now, Paul was asking me this morning, how far do you think we're going to get through the book of Romans today? I said, oh, we're not even going to get into it. He said, what? I said, I thought we were doing Romans. Uh, yeah, but we're not starting in it yet. I got to give you the backdrop. I got to give you the history. I've got to put, the, put you in the right setting so that you understand what it is that we're reading. Now, hopefully and prayerfully, I've got five areas that I want to try to cover with you this morning just as the backdrop, the introduction to the book of Romans. Prayerfully, what time is it? 11.04. Well, I promise you we're not going to be done by 11.30. So let's shoot for no later than 11.45, okay? Will you, can you give me about 40 minutes? Will you give me that? Hopefully in that 40 minutes or so, I can cover these five areas that's going to give you the backdrop of, get this, one of the most important books in the entire Word of God. It's that I want our church to be known as a Bible-preaching church. I want our people to be known as Bible-believing people, right? I don't want to be a church that gets on every bandwagon and every, every fancy silver thing that's flashing through the church markets and the church worlds. And, and it's the introduction to the book of Romans that we're going to start studying every single Sunday morning. So moving forward, here's what I want you to see. I'll, I'm always curious about the length of the book, the length of the letter. I'm always curious about the, the book itself. And uh, so here I want you to see in this book, there are 16 chapters. Now this is referenced to get these numbers. It's referenced strictly out of the, out of the King James version. And, and I'm not a KJV only guy. Uh, I enjoy all other translations as well, but this is where this reference came from. There are 16 different chapters in the book of Romans or book, or chapters. There are 433 verses that we'll find in the book of Romans. And then there's 9,422 words in the book of Romans. Now, 
It may take us a year to get through that. I'm not going to give you a panoramic view. Sometimes I'll go to a book of the Bible or a, a large section of the Bible, and I'll just give you a 35,000-foot view of it, right? We'll just kind of do a flyover, and we'll take four or five weeks, and we'll just kind of look at it from a 35,000-foot view. Well, we're not going to do that. Matter of fact, I want you to put your backpacks on because we're not in an airplane at all. We're going hiking, right? And uh, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a challenge. We're going to go verse by verse by verse. Seriously. We're going to start in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to unpack a little bit in verse 1, and then we're just going to make our way through the book of Romans. So this is going to be a hike. Uh, Debbie and I love to, uh, to go hiking and get out in the woods, and we've hiked a portion of the Appalachian Trail uh, down in North Carolina and Tennessee, and actually this past Monday was her birthday, so I took her down to Giant City, and we did a 12-mile hike down there through one of the, one of the through the state park and one of the trails. and Now, that was our first hike of the season, 11.8 miles. I told her, I said, honey, don't you think we ought to do one of these three-mile hikes or one of these four-mile hikes for our first hike of the season? She said, no, it's my birthday. I want to do the 12-mile hike. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let me tell you, we felt that hike all week long. Hopefully you will feel this as well. As we, so get your backpacks, get your walking sticks out, get your water bottles, get ready. Bring your Bibles or bring your device or bring your tablets or your notebooks. Whatever it is that you use to study with, bring it, right? Because I'm going to be sharing some things. Matter of fact, one of the things you can do also, I always have my sermon notes for you, but there may be something that's said that's not in the notes that you need to write down. There may be something on the screen that's probably not there that maybe you need to take a picture of. I want you to engage in this, right? I want you to dig with me into the book of Romans. Someone asked me one time, I said, what do you think, what do you think the, the most popular verse in Romans is or is there a verse in the entire 16 chapters that you could say pretty well sums up the book of Romans? And I believe there is. Matter of fact, this verse, not only do I believe sums up the book of Romans, I think it sums up the entire epistles of Paul. And I'll share that with you here in just a moment. And by the way, what is an epistle? You know what an epistle is, right? No, it's not the wife of the apostle. That's not an epistle. The epistle is our letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, right? So I believe this verse that I'm going to share with you actually is a theme for all the epistles and all the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. It's found in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Verse 17 is my key verse, but I think verse 16 and 17 sums up, especially the book of Romans. Paul says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I may have this for you. I do. Thank you, whoever changed that for me. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation, and for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I hope and pray that's you. I hope that's me. I don't want to be ashamed when I stand before anybody of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all we have, church. Apart from the gospel, which is the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, apart from that, we don't have anything. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it's the power of salvation. Salvation is going to take place not in church membership, not in communion, not in good works, not in baptism, not in all these other things. It's going to take place when you experience the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and the resurrection. Verse 17 for in it, get this, the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is a key phrase in the book of Romans. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That phrase right there, the just shall live by faith, I believe is the key phrase for the Apostle Paul. Now you got to remember, when Paul was on his missionary journeys, as he was penning and writing these letters, he didn't have the New Testament like we have today to read. All he was banking off of was the Old Testament. You say, well, where in the world that phrase, the just shall live by faith, if that was so pivotal in the life of the Apostle Paul, if that, if that grounded him, if that really was the nucleus of the gospel that he was preaching, where did that come from? Great question. It was influenced, or Paul was influenced in the Old Testament by the prophet Habakkuk. 
Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 4 says this, the just shall live by faith. And Paul brought that out of the Old Testament and built the entire New Testament that we study today, the epistles that he penned and wrote, at least they were heavily influenced by Habakkuk, H-A-B-A-K-U-K-K-A. Somebody check that for me. K-H, Habakkuk, right? Chapter 2 and verse number 4. He was heavily influenced by that prophet in those writings. And it bleeds out in all of his writings in the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. So real quickly, I'm going to share five different areas with you today. Number one, let's talk briefly about the importance of the book of Romans. I want you to understand that all of Scripture is inspired by God. I want you to understand that all of Scripture is very profitable for each and every one of us. But there are some books of the Bible that contain more doctrinal value for us than other books of the Bible. One that comes to mind for me is the book of Numbers, where there's a list of all the genealogies and all the different lists that we find in the book of Numbers. That's great for historical reference. That's great for genealogy studies. That's great for going back and studying some of, of the genealogies and the, the, the lifelines, if you will, traditions, if you will, the, the lineage, if you will, is what I'm trying to get for, for different individuals. That, that's cool for that. But as far as doctrinal value, the book of Romans brings far more doctrinal value <clears throat> than, let's say, the, the book of Numbers. Let's talk about church history. I, I shared this with you in a little video this past week. Church history was very much or has been very much influenced by the book of Romans and the writings of the Apostle Paul whenever he penned the book of Romans. You think about St. Augustine. Guys, you realize that St. Augustine, you can go back and you can study his life. St. Augustine was converted simply by reading the book of Romans. And then you go to the life of Martin Luther, which founded Lutheranism or the Lutheran church. If you remember, he was the founder of the great reformation that took place in 1517, and it kind of lasted all the way up to about 1555 in that area where they finally called a truce between the, the Catholic Church and Protestantism, if you will, or Lutheranism, if you will. And they kind of called a truce, said, okay, they both can coexist, and, and they started finding some measure of peace. But all of that started when Luther read Romans chapter 1, verse number 17, the just shall live by faith. And that's when he pinned his 95 thesis to the wall of the Wittenberg Church in Germany and the Great Reformation started. There's church history there. You can go and study all of that. But it, it was impacted by Romans chapter 1 and verse 17, the just shall live by faith. Then there's the founder of Methodism, John Wesley himself, which by the way, uh, I, uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't say this. But remember I told you some may get offended right here. Some may get offended. John Wesley and Charles Wesley were great men of God. Great men of God. Probably, and this is tongue in cheek. There's no biblical reference to this whatsoever. They're probably rolling over in their grave today if they saw where Methodism has traveled today. Matter of fact, John Wesley, if you've, I've got the whole writings of John Wesley. It's like a five, six volume set. The vo each volume is about that thick. It's the works of John Wesley. And I enjoy some of my pleasure reading, just reading after some of these great men. In some of his writings, some of his journals, he penned this particular incident where they were serving communion in the church. John Wesley was serving communion in the church. We may not get through all five of these. I'm going to stop he was, sermon, he, he was serving communion in the church, and there was a lady that, that he knew was living in sin that came up to take communion. And John Wesley observed it, and he saw it. True story. And as the lady was about to drink the cup, John Wesley comes flying down and slaps the cup out of her hand and 
told her that if she would drink that, she'd be drinking abomination to her soul because she wasn't right with God. Wow. That's some bold stuff, is it not? Hello? Why do you do that? Well, 1 Corinthians teaches us, the Apostle Paul wrote, that if you drink and take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, that many are sick and many have died because they have taken it from an unworthy, as an, in an unworthy manner with sin in their life. That's why before we always serve communion, I give you a chance to pray and ask for forgiveness and get everything right with you and the Lord before you take communion. It's that important. Yeah, that's some of writing John, John Wesley. John Wesley was converted. How was he converted? He came to Christ simply by reading the commentary of Martin Luther that he wrote on the book of Romans, particularly verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 17, the just shall live by faith. And when John Wesley saw that, he too was converted. I believe this. If there is one book of the Bible that every Christian should understand, it is the epistle of Romans, the book of of Romans. If you want to study a good book, if you want to have a solid Christian foundation that doesn't matter what takes place in our culture and what takes place in the world, listen, if you watch every news flash that comes across the TV, and they do that intentionally every 24 hours, there's a cycle that comes, there's a wave that they want you to, I don't get involved in that stuff because it's, it's like, Whew, it's just always to and fro and in and out, tossing and down. Here we go, and this way and that way. No, 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 no. I like stability, right? You find that in the Word of God. And if you want stability in your Christian faith that will see you through the troubled seas and the troubled waters of the day that we live in today, honey, you dig into the book of Romans. You start reading the book of Romans just start reading it. Every, read a portion of it every single day. Ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate it. That's his job. That's his work. That's his ministry. Illuminate the Scripture so that you can have understanding. It's greatest book that you could ever study is the book of Romans. Well, I know you're going to ask, well, why? Why is that? That's quite a bold statement. Well, I'll give you three reasons why, and I did a little video on this one also. One of the reasons why you should study the book of Romans is because of the doctrinal, everybody say doctrinal. I hope I don't get too deep here and lose you. I don't want to lose anybody. I want you to stay with me as we go through this. Because of the doctrinal study, or the doctrinal truth, I should say, that is presented in the book of Romans. I mean, think about it. Think about the doctrine of justification. That's unpacked in Romans. Think about the doctrine of sanctification. That too is unpacked in Romans. Think about the doctrine of adoption. Guys, you realize that we have been adopted into the family of God? Well, what does all that mean? We'll unpack that together as we go through the book of Romans. Also, the doctrine of judgment is found in the book of Romans. Also, the doctrine of our identification with Christ is found in the book of Romans. If for no other reason, the doctrinal truths that are unpacked for us in Romans is a great reason why we should read it. But secondly, I want you to think about this one. The dispensational truth that is presented, especially in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Those three chapters deal with Israel, God, and the church. Those dispensational time frames. And by the way, dispensationalism is a great doctrine that you should unpack. There are, there are time frames within Scripture, and a lot of people have their theology wrong because their dispensation is wrong, and their timeline is wrong, and they're looking at things and pulling things in this dispensation into this dispensation, and you can't do that. You've got to be able to rightly divide the time frame. We're going to unpack some of that as we get into Romans 9, Romans 10, Romans 11, is where Paul unpacks some dispensational truth for each and every one of us. But then there's also the practical truth, the doctrine of practical truth that is unpacked for us. What are the secrets of victorious Christian living? Do you realize that you can live a victorious Christian life or you can live a defeated 
woe is me, worn out, exhausting Christian life. Now both are Christians. One is living victorious, and one is living like Eeyore. Woe is me. <laughs> right? What's the difference? It's how they're applying the practical truths of God's Word to their life. It's how they're living their life. It's principles that they live their life by. It's standards, it's convictions, and numerous other things. We'll unpack some of those. But also, on the practical truth side of things, there's the teachings to fellow believers, Christians, on how we are to treat one another. Does Paul tell us how we should treat each other within the church? Sure he does. He's going to unpack some of that for us here in the book of Romans. So we're going to see on the practical side some of the duties that we have as Christians to one another. Some of the responsibilities that we have as Christians to one another. I want you to look around. Just kind of put your head on the swivel right now. Just look. Look who's sitting around you. Now let me, let me tell you this. You realize that every single one of you guys and everybody that you just looked at right now, you have a responsibility to one another. You have a duty that you're to serve out to one another. You're just, you're just not sitting here just isolated all by yourself and life is just all about me. No. It's about everyone in this room serving one another, loving one another. The duties and responsibilities that we have towards one another. We'll unpack some of that as we go through the book of Romans. And then, on the practical side as well, there's some teachings that the Apostle Paul gives us about some of the duties of Christians and fellow believers in their relationship with their government. That will be interesting. Hello? We're going to unpack that too as we go through the book of Romans. You see, one of the reasons, several reasons here, why I think it's one of the most important books that any born-again believer should ever be reading and studying, it's the book of Romans for the doctrinal, the dispensational, and the practical truths that we find there. Let me give you something else here. And we're still under number one. I promise you I'm going to stop at 1145 regardless of where we are. Still under the importance of the book of Romans. Romans is a great exposition of the Christian. Everybody say Christian. Christian. That's what we are. We are Christians. We got that word in the Bible. It's a slang term that they called us because we were what? Christ-like. We resembled the attitude, the mindset, the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. We reflected Jesus in our actions and in our reactions and the way we live. So what we find here in the book of Romans, I believe, is a great exposition of the Christian faith. And it is the complete and the most logical presentation of Christian truth in the entire New Testament. Honey, you've landed on a good book. What an amazing book. I've never preached verse by verse the book of Romans in my 35 years of ministry. I've studied it. I've done 35,000 foot panoramic view of it. I've dug in at different doctrines in it. So I'm as excited as you are to sit and go verse by verse through the book of Romans. It's going to be an amazing journey. Wonderful presentation. Something else, another slide here I've got for you. If a Bible student wishes to master any one book of the Bible, let it be the book of Romans. And understanding to this book is the key. Everybody say the key. key. An understanding of the book of Romans is the key to unlocking the entire Word of God. Pretty important book. Would you agree? I want you to see the magnitude of what we're jumping into just before I jumped into Romans 1.1. 1, 1. 
It is a very important book. Well, real quickly, and I may just get as far as this one. Let me give you a little bit of the background of the book of Romans. Okay? We've talked about the importance of it. Well, let me give you the backdrop of the book of Romans. Who wrote Romans? We know that. You know that. Who wrote it? The Apostle Paul. Where was he when he wrote it? Do you know? Well, Acts chapter 20, in verse 1 and 3, speaks to us about this three-month stay or visit that the Apostle Paul had in Corinth. And while he was in Corinth, he wrote this letter to the believers that were gathered together in Rome. How did the letter get there? Well, Romans chapter 6 verse 1 tells us that Phoebe, one of the sisters in the faith, took the letter that Paul penned to the believers that were there in Rome. The question is, how did there come become a group of believers in Rome? Trick question, don't jump on it too fast. Was there an established church in Rome when Paul wrote this letter? Don't answer it yet. It is a trick question, so don't assume there was. Okay? But let that start settling in. Was there a church? Who is Paul writing to? How did they get there? All these are great questions that you would ask as a Bible student trying to unpack the book of Romans and discern why it is that the Apostle Paul wrote it. Well, how did these group of believers get to Rome? Well, I want you to note, matter of fact, in Romans 1, if you want to look in your Bible, I don't have a verse for this. But in Romans 1 and verse number 7, I want you to see this. I want you to note, pay attention, Paul does not address this letter to the church at Rome. How does he address this letter? It's found in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 7. By the way, I want you to look in Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Look at the very first word. What does it say? Paul. In Old Testament or, or in biblical times when they would write a letter, they would always tell you who wrote the letter at the very beginning. Nowadays, when we, we write letters, we don't even write letters anymore, but if we did write a letter... The salutation, or not the salutation, but the signature is where? It's at the end, at the bottom of the letter, or the end of the letter. So, have you ever gotten a letter from someone, and you can't tell who it's from by the, by the envelope or the address on it, and you open it up, and it just starts out, dear so-and-so, yourself, and it starts, and, and you say, who wrote this letter? And you go all the way to the end, and oh, this is from Aunt Susie. This is her Christmas letter, right? Or whatever the case may be. Get it? Got it? Good. All right. So, the way we write letters, we sign it at the end. They wrote letters back in Paul's day in biblical times. They signed it at the beginning. So they're telling you, which I like that. You know who's writing this letter. Paul is saying Paul, and then he goes on. But I want you to look who he's addressing it to. Look in verse 7. This is key. To all who are in Rome. To all who are in Rome. Notice he does not address the letter to the church at Rome. That's just what I want you to see. He addresses the letter to all who are in Rome. We just did our New Testament or, or foundation study in our church-wide reading together, and I send this out to you every single Monday morning at 6 a.m., so I hope you're taking advantage of that. But we recently had studied through the book of Romans. My small group meets on Tuesday mornings at 1130 here at the church. I came in that week. Actually, it wasn't that week. I missed that week. The next week, because I took them back to that week, I said, guys, if you will, I would like to go back to one of the readings from last week. I missed our small group time together, but it had such an impact on me. I wanted to share it with you. With you. And I took my small group back to Romans chapter 16. In Romans chapter 16, it's a great chapter. Paul gives a list of all of these people that had helped him in ministry. I love that, that chapter. Let me tell you why. Because I could write a list at Victory Church of all those people that helped me in ministry here at Victory Church. 
Paul was a man that, yeah, he preached the Word of God, but he had a lot of friends. He had a lot of people. There were a lot of people that respected him. Yeah, they were, I never realized they got put in prison for preaching the gospel. I understand all that. But there were a lot of people that, that loved Paul and that liked Paul. And so when you read Romans chapter number 16, you can't help but notice the different groups of believers which suggest that there is not one local assembly that, that was there. If there had been, then Paul would have addressed the church at Rome. He doesn't do that. He addresses all these different individuals now that had gathered in Rome. Well, let me share with you a little tradition. Now, I don't think there's any historical foundation to this. I don't think there's any scriptural foundation to this. Are you still with me? I don't want to lose you in some of this. Some folks get just kind of completely bored with stuff like this. I hope that's not you. I'm trying to make it as interesting as I can, right? But I want to share with you a little tradition about what tradition says about who started the church at Rome. Or even if there was a church at the time of this writing in Rome. You've probably heard this. How many have heard that Peter started the church at Rome? Raise your hand. That's tradition. There's no historical evidence of that. There's no scriptural evidence of that. There's nothing to support that view whatsoever that Peter, now St. Peter of the church at, finish it for me, guys. Rome, Rome right? They tie him in. There's who started the church at Rome. No, I, I differ with you there. I realize that's tradition. I realize it's been passed down. There's no historical, more importantly, there's no scriptural reference that would indicate that Peter started the church at Rome. Now, we studied through the book of Peter. Did Peter go to Rome? He did. Was he supposed to go to Rome? He wasn't. Did he get in trouble in Rome? He did. You remember all that? We went through all that. We studied all of that, right? So tradition says it claimed that Peter... That he lived in Rome for these 25 years, but that, or for 25 years, but that fact cannot be proved. If, everybody say if, if Peter had started the church at Rome, I believe then certainly there would have been an organized church rather than a scattered body of believers that was there in Rome at the time, even when Peter was there, and even when Paul is writing there. Paul greets all these friends in Romans chapter number 16. But notice, he never mentions Peter in Romans 16. Well, if Peter was the church planner, and if Peter had established a church there, don't you think Paul would have at least referenced him there? No reference of him in Romans chapter 16. Certainly, somewhere in all the epistles that Paul wrote, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, 2 Timothy, Paul would have at least mentioned Peter if that great apostle had been ministering anywhere in Rome, he would have mentioned that. Here's something else. The most telling argument against Peter as the founder of the work in Rome is found in Romans 15. I want you to turn there. I hope you're not getting bored with me. I'm going to stop after this one. Just so you know, the end is coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Romans 15. I want you to look in verse 20. Here's a telling verse of Scripture that I believe is the most solid evidence against Peter having already planted the church there. Look in Romans 15 and verse number 20. I'm just going to pick it up and read it. I don't like doing this and just pulling the verse and reading it just because I, I always like to give you the context of it, but you can go back and read it for yourself. Look what he find, says in verse number 20, Romans 15. And so, and I'm reading, by the way, in this study, I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. I, I enjoy the New Living Translation. I enjoy the ESV. I enjoy other translations. 
I, I, do my, I do my original digging and studying out of the King James. I like the new King James because it's real close to the King James, but a little bit updated language helps you understand it a little bit better. So that's what I'm going to be doing all this study out of. Use whatever translation is good for you. And he says in verse 20, And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel. What's he doing? He's preaching the gospel. Where? Not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. If Peter had already gotten there and planted a church in Rome, Paul would have no desire to go there because another man would have already been there to build and plant a church. Paul didn't have any desire to go where a church was already planted. He was a church planter. Right? He went around on his missionary journeys establishing churches, putting them together, putting a pastor in place, talking to them about organization and leaders and elders and, and, and what have you that are within the body of church. And then going back around and ministering to them, being true that, or being certain that they're staying true to the doctrines and the teaching of the Word of God. That was the ministry of the Apostle Paul. If Peter had already been in Rome, he says in verse 20 of Romans 15, I have no desire to go where any man has already built a church. I don't want to go and build on another man's foundation. That's the words of the apostle Paul himself. To me, that's pretty strong evidence that there wasn't a church there already. Paul was anxious to visit Rome and to minister to the saints. And that's his wording, to minister to the saints. Now, the saints, people ask, who are the saints? In the biblical term, when it talks about you being a saint, it talks about that simply means a believer. Right? An individual that has already accepted Christ as their Savior. Every single one of you, I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them you're a saint. You are. Theologically speaking, maybe not practically. <laughs> Theologically speaking, we're saints. Right? Now, I realize in the church tradition of the culture in the world today, there's a board that gets together and, and they review a man's life and, or a woman's life and they determine if he or she is a saint. They build statues of them and all of that. Here, there's a problem. You, just, you, just, you don't find that in Scripture. Say amen or on me, but let me know you're listening. I don't want to offend you. I want to give you the truth, right? A saint, and we're going to talk about we're going to drill down on the doctrine of the sainthood of the believer. We'll talk about that in Romans. But Paul was anxious to visit Rome, to minister to the saints, to the Christians that were there. Romans 1, 13. Romans 15, 22 through 24. Verse 28, 29 of Romans 15. Acts 19, 21. Acts 23, 11. But he would not have made these plans if another apostle had already started a church there. Well, the question is then, how did the gospel get to Rome? Let me real quickly get this there for you, and I'll stop. In Acts chapter 2, if you remember on the day of Pentecost, it indicates that on the day of Pentecost that there were people from Rome that were there on the day of Pentecost. Several are named Priscilla and Aquila, they were Roman Jews, that they had accepted the gospel, and they were from Rome. In Romans 16, I've already referenced this numerous times, but what you find here, you find a list of a lot of Gentiles. There were some Jewish believers, but mostly Gentile Christians that were from other cities that had gathered or gravitated to Rome. Rome was the major metropolis city of the area. I mean, it's almost like New York City of our day. Rome was that city. Matter of fact, all roads did lead to Rome, right? Everybody kind of wanted to get to Rome, get to Rome, get to Rome. So everybody, a lot of folks would migrate to Rome. So even on the day of Pentecost, there were a lot of people that became born again believers. Remember, thousands and thousands were saved after Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. You remember that story? Well, then they had to go back home. Most of them went back to Rome, and some just gravitated there for other reasons. And these people, a lot of them, were also probably converts of the Apostle Paul on some of his other missionary journeys that he had, he had been in. They just didn't stay there. They traveled just like we would travel. And so there were some that had migrated into Rome. So there are believers there that are Rome. Paul knows that some believers are now in Rome. 
And he has this passion and this desire to write this doctrinal truth and book to them, this letter to them. Why is it, do you think? Because he knew the Judaizers were on his heels. He knew that everywhere he went and preached the gospel about a about an individual repenting of their sins and trusting in Christ and their Savior and having a relationship with Jesus and not going through religious rituals but simply just having a relationship with Jesus Christ. He knew the Judaizers were coming right behind him and saying, okay, if you're going to be a Christian, oh, I guess it's okay if you Gentiles are going to be a Christian, but you're going to have to act like and dress like and talk like and even have your male children circumcised if they're going to be in our Christian faith. Paul said, no, 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 no. So Paul wanted to write to them real quickly before the Judaizers got to them in Rome to tell them and warn them and teach them the doctrines of the Christian faith. Well, that's a little bit of the background of Romans. Guys, I'm going to stop right there. I've got at least another hour in me of getting through these other three, and I'm not going to drag you through all that. I hope you'll come back next Sunday.